Hi, my name is Derek Gunther. I'm Senior Application Scientist here at Ocean Insight. And as we all know, our world is plagued with many different diseases. And in recent months, this year in particular, we've heard of a new one that uh, you may know of. I always forget the name. It's called coronavirus. You're, you may have to look that up on Wikipedia. Joking aside, as we all fight to work through the coronavirus pandemic, we do have four key tools to actively fight that. And those include, one, distancing. Two, we have vaccines. Three, treatments and then four, the detection aspect of it. And that's what we're gonna look at today. And detection really includes both the virus itself for those that are currently infected and antibodies to let us know who has had the virus, where the virus has been historically so that we can trace things and intelligently know how to plan for the next steps in this whole uh, phase reduction approach. The traditional methods for looking at detection are uh, tr typically using PCR or polymerase chain reaction, but it does have limitations, mainly in how much time it takes. So what we're looking at here is actually a laser interrogation technique called Raman. So what is Raman? When you throw photons at a molecule, most of them come out of the molecule at the same energy level, and that's called Rayleigh scatterings, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes, and it's a very low probability, we're talking a one in a million chance here, that the photon will interact with the molecular structure and different ligands and functional groups in such a way that it either picks up or loses some energy based on that structure. And what we have here are actually uh, some antibody samples from the SARS-CoV-1-2 uh, protein. So let's take a look and see how well we can do at detecting this using the typical Raman SIR setup. First, let's look at all the hardware that we're using for this. So this includes our laser source, the 785 laser source. We can see here on the front of the display, we have some numbers shown in red, and this is an arbitrary power output for this unit because this offers adjustable power. We want to make sure that we have enough power to get signal, but not so much that we're burning the sample. So we have it right now set to 0.321, uh, which is a bit arbitrary, but is equivalent to roughly 25 milliwatts of power. And this probe that we're using, this is one of our standard 785 nanometer laser probes that has individual fibers to run uh, to the laser and then also to the spectrometer. And this is going to attenuate the power from the laser a bit. So that's why we can't just take the laser power directly from the laser, but we're actually taking it out of the output port of the probe itself. The spectrometer we're using here is the QE Pro high performance spectrometer. And this is a high resolution spectrometer with very good uh, sensitivity for low light scenarios, such as Raman emissions, which are very low probability types of emissions. And this has been a tried and true device for well over a decade for us and for many customers that are using it at uh, applications that are pushing the limits of spectral detection. And what we're using with these components is a SERS holder. So this is a holder for our substrates. So these substrates come in a convenient five pack and they're very low cost. So they're meant to be consumables. And these fit right into the Raman SERS holder, just like so. So we have this sample from Sigma uh, in just a very small 25 microliter volume, but that gives us enough even at that microliter level to get some meaningful SERS measurements out of that. So all we're going to do is show you how easy it is to take a sample background scan of our SERS substrate and then apply the analyte and get a meaningful reading from that sample. So this is ultra pure water that we acquired. And this is also the same water that we reconstituted the protein back into solution. So that's uh, important that we're not using different types of water that may have different impurities in them that could show up as different analytes. So we know that this is a very good blank. So we're just taking about five microliters of this and we're gonna place it onto our SERS substrate and we're gonna inject it just like so. We're gonna stick that right into the holder. Now, if we turn on our laser, we're gonna see some emissions here. So the first plot that we're looking at right here on the left is just the raw Raman output. And this is set up through a very simple wizard where all you're essentially doing is taking a dark scan with the laser off and then with the laser on, now we're seeing all these emissions and changing our X values to let's say maybe 350. 
and now we can see some clear uh, Raman activity. What we're looking at in this view is what's called clean peaks. Clean peaks is an algorithm that will automatically detect what it believes to be background signal or a baseline, and it turns that into a, a stable x-axis reading, and it allows any peaks that it deems as statistically significant over that baseline to register as actual peaks. So you can actually still see those meaningful activities there. So again, if we scale this, we're getting some nice emission. Now the last view that we have here is called SNV view. This looks very similar to the raw output, but let's take a look at the y-axis and how these are different. So in the raw view, we're seeing intensity counts in the order of thousands of counts. But now, even though this says intensity counts, it's actually a, a transformation. It's an SNV transformed intensity reading. And what this does is it brings everything to more of an integer level right around the x-axis. And we can go into the schematic and see exactly what that's doing and why we're doing that. So what we're doing here is we're actually taking a subrange of this, this limited area of the spectrum across the x-axis that we know is, is an area we want to look at, and we're taking an average of that. And now we're subtracting that average from the signal. So this is the key signal, this is the raw signal, and we're taking the average over that range, which we can now see is around 13, 1400 uh, counts, we're subtracting that, and then we're dividing it by the standard deviation, which is this node here. The standard deviation at this point in time is around 330 counts. And we're dividing it by that value, and what that's doing is normalizing this uh, right around the x-axis. And this can be very important and meaningful to pull apart activities that are otherwise hidden uh, in the signal. A useful part of Ocean View is the ability to take some snapshots of what you're looking at now. So if we click on this camera icon, it's going to freeze that in place of what we're looking at now. Let's do that here on this one as well. So we know what this looks like now, what to expect without our analyte present. So let's go ahead and apply some of our COVID antibody on there. So we're going to take out our substrate, uncap our reconstituted COVID antibody. We're going to take another five microliters. Let's stick that right onto the, onto the substrate there. Excellent. So now, with this protein present, let's stick that right back into our holder. And now we're seeing some different activities than we were. So in the raw view, we just see an overall vertical jump. Right? And sometimes that can make things difficult to determine where changes are actually occurring because you're seeing so much of a vertical offset that the individual minute changes aren't so easy to pick out. Right, But that's where our SNV comes in. Now we're looking at the SNV view and now we're seeing relative to the original signal some depressions and some amplifications. These peaks that were present uh, both before and after those are inherent to some of the proprietary components we put into these substrates to help with that enhancement. And that's why it's important to take that background. But knowing where those activities are, that that's something, for example, here that's very consistent, we can see then that we're getting an amplification of the signal right in this region, and we're getting some depressions down in other regions here. And, uh, and we're seeing a little bit, I'm actually seeing a good, nice peak formation right there, which uh, we saw in some prior uh, COVID-related samples. So this is something that uh, may very well hold true and would be an important part of a measurement for COVID detection. So the point here is to show how easy it is to just apply a few microliters of sample to your substrate, put it into the ramen holder, and get some meaningful measurements and some really unique peak activities out of your analyte, even at trace levels of things that are very hard to detect, such as novel biologicals and things like that. This form factor uses gold nanoparticles embedded into a proprietary quartz matrix. The gold, which is tuned for 785 nanometers, we also offer it in silver, which is more tuned to 532 nanometers, and both of which can be used with 638 nanometer lasers. 
This is the same gold colloid or gold nanoparticles that we put into the solid substrates, but they're left in aqueous solution called L-SIRS or liquid SIRS. And this brings with it a whole range of benefits. The most notable of which is probably the long shelf life. The shelf life on these is a year or longer. The solid substrates all come with a batch number and a best if use by date. Now that best if used by date is not an expiration date. That's a common question. You're going to get essentially 100% performance from these if they're used before that date and kept stored well. But as you pass that date, you may be getting 90% performance, 80% performance, and you get that degradation over time. The ELSERS, the liquid form factor, doesn't see that same degradation. The ELSERS will be stable for a year or more. The other big improvement that these offer is repeatability for concentration and quantification of the analyte. In the liquid form factor, everything is very homogeneously distributed and very uniformly present in that aqueous solution. As a result, you get much more repeatable concentration measurements so that you're able to quantify things with much higher accuracy and confidence. The other key thing to note is the laser power. You can't burn these. This is just an inaqueous solution. So that, that water-based uh, solution is never going to burn, even at maximum laser power. So we have another great accessory here, a vial holder that lets you put this right in to the sample holder and then have the probe butt up right against the vial and it's focused perfectly so that you're having that Raman laser focus right in the middle of that analyte solution. So we're gonna go ahead and place the LSERS into the holder and put the laser right into its respective holder. And there's a set screw here to make sure everything is nice and secure. Put the cap on. Then let's take a background scan. So in the software, we can go ahead and just hit the dark button and we can see that that's been uh, zeroed out. And so now if we go ahead and take this out and add in some of our analyte. So we're gonna take actually now about 10 microliters of our COVID antibody. We're going to place that into the ulcers, give it a little bit of a swirl, and place that back in the vial holder. And now we're getting a fresh reading. So let's take a look at our raw mode. And notice that we're not seeing quite as much activity here uh, as we had with the solid substrates. But there's goes to show how easy it is to apply some sample into a liquid SIRS measurement and then take that snapshot. It's very important to take an initial background snapshot so that you can subtract that out or do an SNV processing or something like that to really capture what the true activity of the analyte is. Additionally, you need to find that Goldilocks zone for the laser power. If you go too high on the laser power, you're gonna burn the sample, and you're gonna know that because your spectra are going to go off the charts, and you're going to see smoke physically coming off of your substrate or off of the sample there. On the flip side, if you don't add enough laser power, you're not gonna get that photo interaction, you're not gonna get that Raman emission that's really gonna tell you about your sample. A common question that folks have is about multi-use. Can you use these multiple times on uh, different analytes or the same analyte? We don't recommend it for different analytes, but on the same analyte, you can actually use different parts of the real estate of this substrate because there is enough room there to potentially put on some additional aliquots of, of fluid that has the analyte in there. And you can also use the same substrate for a blank, as we saw in the demo, taking a blank water sample is first on the same substrate and then bringing in the analyte to take a snapshot of that. We do recommend that you keep them in the sealed bag. When you're applying your analyte, try not to use more than 15 microliters. You don't want your substrate to be too wet. And lastly, you wanna make sure you have the right combo of metal and wavelength and analyte. And what does that mean? Well, we offer both gold and silver SIRS substrates. You wanna pick a metal that's in tune with the laser wavelength. Additionally, there's certain analytes that have a higher affinity for a certain metal. So that's one of the key things to make sure you're really getting the right combo of the metal type, the analyte, and that wavelength so that they're in tune with each other and you're getting the most out of your Raman signals.